scripture reading this morning is found in the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. That's James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, on page 1208, if you're using one of the Pew Bibles. Follow along as I read, beginning in verse 14 of James, chapter 2. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works." You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Let's pray. We continue in our study this morning in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, you recall that the writer of Hebrews writing to this Jewish audience is going through Old Testament heroes of the faith. And he shows them what saving faith looks like. You know, you can't see faith, but it's demonstrated, and it's demonstrated in the lives of these people that we have been looking at in Hebrews 11. In my devotions, I have been reading through Psalm 119, and it's just been a rich time for me personally to go through. And I've come to Psalm 119, verse 35. You don't have to turn there, but it says this. Make me walk in the path of your commandments. Causative language there. God, you make me. You make me walk in the path of your commandments. It's a prayer. There's other things listed in that part of the psalm, but part of the prayer is, God, you make me. The inclination of my heart is not to do that, God. I I need you to do that. You to do that. The Hebrew word for the word path, this is interesting to me, the word path is the visible path. Get this, the visible path. It's a path that maybe is caused by a wake in the water or a path that is a well-worn path. You ever been for a walk in the woods? You you want to kind of find the path, you know? You don't want to just kind of trailblaze. You want to find the path, the well-worn path that others have trodden. It's a trodden path is the Hebrew word there. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not a new way, but it's the accustomed, the accustomed trail that this word means. God, God, make me or yeah, make me walk on that accustomed, well-worn path. Is the idea there? There's a verse in Jeremiah 15. The Puritans really like this verse. It says this. Jeremiah, excuse me, 6.16, listen to this. Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. Hear that? The ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. James Boyce says something in his commentary. We live in an age of innovations. We live in an age where anything that is Old is bad. If it's good, it's new, right? We even sell old things in a new way, he says. The new 
Chevy Impala, the new and improved Colgate toothpaste, right? New, just something new, the new twist on everything. It's got to be new because we think that way, and that's very much part of our culture to think new because new is better. Ann and I, this winter, went out to buy a TV, and it's been a long time since we bought a TV, but we were, the one we had was kind of small, and, you know, I couldn't read the scores anymore on this TV. <laughs> and aging eyes have nothing to do with this, folks. It was really just a bad TV. It had to go. And so we go to the place where you buy TVs here in town, and I'm talking to the guy, and we've done a little research, and I find the TV that I really like. I say, this is it. I, this is a great TV. But the salesperson did the unpardonable. He walks up and he says, man, I can work you out a great deal on that TV. It's last year's model. I thought, oh no, it's old. <laughs> I automatically thought, you're going to sell me a 2013 TV in 2014 that just won't work. <laughs> Keep in mind, anything, anything newer than 1995 would have been new for us, but just the fact, the fact that he said that was last year's model. We ended up getting it, but I've just never felt the same about it. <laughs> it's last year's model, but you got the idea uh, just sounded old when he said that. See, this psalm that I read to you, it reminds us, it reminds us that, <laughs> get this, the Lord's way is not new. You got that? It's the old and ancient paths. It's the well-trodden paths. It's the well-worn paths. Folks, in the Christian life, we are not called to be innovators. We are called to be imitators, right? Imitators, to imitate others who have gone before us in this walk of faith and who lived, have lived this life before us, and who demonstrate to us, hey, this is a life worth living. This is a life worth giving yourself to. This is a life that matters. This is a life that you can count on. This is a life that will take you to glory, no matter what you face in life. This is the well-worn path, ancient paths. It's not something new. And we live in a world where everything has got to be new, and the church buys into everything's got to be new. New ways of spirituality, new ways to look at God, new ways, new, new, new. Everything's new. Listen, we're not called to be innovators, but imitators. Hebrews 11, it's good for that, good for us in that, because what we have here are men and women who have gone before us and who have lived a life of faith and who, as a result, give us a pattern by which to live our lives. And I remind you, I remind you this, it is a narrow way. It is a narrow way, Jesus says, and few are those who find it. It is a narrow way, and few are those who get on it. Don't be surprised if you walk on this path that there are going to be very few with you, and that it's, not going, to, and it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's a narrow path. It's not a popular path. It's not innovative, innovative at all. It's a well-worn, ancient path. And see, I have you in Hebrews 11, and the individual that we came to is the one who is probably the most well-known in all Judaism, Abraham. And we talked about this scene in verses 17 through 19 last time where it says in verse 17, Abraham was tested, and I told you this, that folks, you need to count on this. If you have true saving faith, if you faith, have true saving faith, you will be tested. You will be tested. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Abraham is an older man at this point in his life. He has walked with God for a long time, and he is tested. His faith was tested. Take this child you have waited 25 years for. 
in the miracle of his birth, and now it's 25 more years have passed. The child's probably about 20 years old. Isaac, the one through whom the promise will come. I mean, if I'm going to be a father of many nations, I've got to have an offspring, and God finally gives me this offspring, Isaac, and now God's telling me to go kill this child, sacrifice this child. God, what about the promise of descendants? And God, what about your command here to go and sacrifice my son? So we saw that scene a couple weeks ago. We see in verse um, 18, it was to him whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. And it says, Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. He knew God will somehow keep his promise. His faith um, helped him draw that conclusion that this is a promise that God will keep and it will keep it through Isaac. And how he will do that, I do not know, but he can raise people from the dead, so I'm going to obey him. And my point was that faith is tested. You may be going through a test. You're going to be tested. You might, it may be your job. It may be finances. It may be your health. It may be all of those kinds of things. You, you just name it. Your marriages and all of those things. We will be tested. Is our faith really there. It's not that God needs more information about me. It's that I need to see. I need to see how divided my heart is. I need to see all the idols in my own heart. I need to see the props I've got going on where I'm trusting in instead of God. I need to see that sometimes. That's a very good cleansing thing. I I know that I came into this Christian life with a lot of residual flesh and a lot of residual um, sin that I still have to deal with in my Christian life. And one thing God does is he tests my heart. Testing is trials and testing are how God helps to purge and cleanse me of those things. That's what 1 Peter 1 said, the proof of your faith, more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor the revelation of Jesus Christ. The purpose of Testing gold is not to destroy the gold, it's to get rid of the impurities. So you, you will go through testing. That I, the Lord, test the heart. That is a reality. That is a reality that we must understand. The purpose is to purify us. Incline my heart. <laughs> Incline my heart toward you, God. You know what? I don't want to bow. That means to bow down before God, to bow your heart before God. If you're like me, my heart resists that. My heart resists bowing to this book, to his word. God, I need you. I need you. And God says, well, I will test your heart and show you those props, those idols, those things that you are trusting in besides me. Abraham uh, Abraham was vindicated. Abraham was shown to be one who trusted God because he was willing to take something so precious and so valuable and willing to say, no, God is first. God is first in my life. And he was praised for that. So we learned a lot from Abraham in that particular scene of his life, for sure. Well, I want to take you to James this morning, because in the book of James, which is just a few pages to the right in your Bible, in a passage I read earlier, because this scene is mentioned in that passage And I want to just talk about that with you this morning. I at times allude to this passage, but I've never really taken you through some of the highlights of it. And I wanted to take a little time this morning to do that, especially to verse 21 of James chapter 2. Verse 21 of James chapter 2. It says, What's not Abraham? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. Let me read that statement, okay? Then it gets a little more interesting. It goes down to verse 24. Still talking about Abraham. It says, you see that a man is, or in the context of Abraham, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now listen, I took this church, the entire book of Romans, and I can tell you one thing. When I read a statement like that, I see contradiction. Uh, Just on face value, I see contradiction in that verse. I mean, is that what we have been taught? Is that what the Reformers stood for? Is that what they meant by sola fide? 
faith alone? You see, how does this statement in verse 24, how does it harmonize with what we learned in Romans, what we learned from the Apostle Paul, that faith alone is what saves you? Listen to this verse in Romans 3, 28. For we maintain, this is Romans 3, 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works. That's what Paul says. And then you read James 2.24, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Listen to this in James uh, 2.21, was not Abraham our father, you just read this to you, justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? And then Paul in Romans chapter 4 says, what shall we say then? Abraham our forefather according to the flesh has found. Talking in that text Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wage is credited as favor, but as what is due. But the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. In other words, Paul says it wasn't Abraham's works that saved him. It was Abraham's faith that saved him that made him right before a holy God. James says, Abraham was justified by works. And so we have what may seem like a contradiction. How is a person made right with a holy God? Is the Roman Catholic Church correct? Because at the Council of Trent, at the time of the Reformers, the Roman Catholic Church, refuting the Protestants, use James 2.24 as their defense passage. They use that very verse in the context of Abraham. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Are they right? Is a man justified by both faith and works? What is the focus of justification? What is the gospel Very important question. It is the crux question. You can have differences about baptism. You can have differences about how often to take the Lord's table. You can have differences about all kinds of issues, but not this one. This is an essential doctrine of Christianity. How is a person made right before God? How does these statements of James fit into what I just read you from the Apostle Paul, how do you harmonize these things that are being said here? Some say there's a contradiction in the Bible, but that's not possible. Um, it's the Holy Spirit is the author. He doesn't speak with a forked tongue. Um, some people say that, like Luther, this is a straw epistle. He didn't like it. He couldn't harmonize it. He never really harmonized it. There's a battle which has gone on for a long time in Christendom. It's the battle of faith and works. Um, When I was in seminary, I remember in the time I was in college, and maybe it's still popular today, the little Campus Crusade Four Spiritual Laws booklet, and in it would give you the diagrams of being separated from God. It gave you a great gospel presentation. Uh, and then at the end of it, it would give you a prayer to pray, the sinner's prayer, and you would pray that. And then if a person prayed that, then they were t- immediately told that they uh, had assurance of salvation. They shouldn't base it on feeling. They should base it on fact. That if you, and, and the fact was, if you prayed this prayer and you believed this message, then you were a Christian. That was, that was pretty much Uh, how the gospel was presented. You were immediately given assurance. Uh, If your life did not change, that did not matter. If your life did not change at all, that didn't matter because there was a category for you. It was called the carnal Christian category. And you would be placed in that category, a fleshly Christian, if your life did not change. You could say, I believe in the facts of the gospel, but I'm just not going to live according to the Bible. Obedience was not an issue in this view. Uh, It was optional. 
And you never question if anybody was really saved. You never question it. Of course they're saved. They prayed that prayer. They went forward. They signed a card or whatever. They gave some public demonstration in that sense that they were a Christian. Um, I talk about this carnal Christian category. It came from uh, Lewis, other places as well. Lewis Berry Schaefer's book, He Did Spiritual, he had a section in there on 1 Corinthians 3 talking about the Corinthian believers who were carnal they lived carnal lives, and refer, refers to them as carnal, being carnal. And uh, a category was developed from that passage uh, for believers who, cho- who were not walking before God. This became labeled as easy believism, just assent to the facts of the gospel. doesn't matter how you live your life, you're a Christian, and we will give you assurance of salvation um, I heard the other day um, on um, uh, someone speaking, but he was referring to an article in Christianity Today where it said, and I'm not picking on this denomination, but in the Southern Baptist Convention, and I, this, the reason for this is they just had their convention, but the point is they have 15 million people who have been baptized and said they are believers within the Southern Baptist denomination. But they also made this statement, of which they're very worried about, only 5 million go to church. Only 5 million go to church. They're missing 10 million people. 10 million people that say they are Christians. In the 1990s, John MacArthur wrote a book entitled The Gospel According to Jesus. Uh, Let me just back up for a second. On my seminary campus at Dallas Seminary, we used to have discussions about this issue because it was a real problem. We had people that were saying they were Christians and then their lives did not show it, didn't matter. They still were being given assurance they would go to heaven. It didn't matter. And we would have discussions about, uh, does Christ have to be Lord of your life? Does Christ have to have some right to call you to obedience? And should that be expected? And all those things. We'd have discussions on that. In the 1990s, John MacArthur writes this book entitled, The Gospel According to Jesus. And also he wrote, The Gospel According to the Apostles, where he examines what the gospel says in in the words of Christ, in the words of the apostles. And what he does in that book is he takes James' side of the issue. He pulls the church's, seeks to pull the church's thinking back to James. James is thinking on the issue to give people a proper understanding of what true saving faith is. What is true saving faith? Understand, the Reformers thought a lot about this. They realized when they broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and kind of went out there and talked about faith alone, the first question is going to be, well, define that faith for us. I mean, that's a legitimate concern. What is true saving faith? Even Paul faced that in Romans chapter 6. What shall we then do? Keep on sinning so grace may abound? He had to give a definition, and he does that in Romans chapter 6 of what he's talking about by grace. John MacArthur, of course, was accused and, and been called, and those who have held to his view have been accused of being in the camp called Lordship and Salvation. This book also attacked the carnal Christian category. It doesn't attack the fact that Christians act carnally. Of course Christians act carnally. The question, can that be an ongoing lifestyle for years and years and years, and you have the hope, because I live in this carnal Christian category, that I will face heaven? Like, there is some carnal Christian category category in the Bible. Is it truly a biblical category is the question. Not, do I act that way? I do that. You do that all the time. The question is, is that a continuous issue of lifestyle and people being given assurance that they will go to heaven just as long as they profess Jesus and it doesn't matter how I live in the end. Folks, this is a big issue. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here this morning. If a person makes a profession of faith, Is that all that matters is the question. See, I think we go to extremes on this. I think think the the former view I gave you of the easy believism, the issue I saw when I was coming along, uh, and, and the attitude within the church, I think that was one extreme. 
I think we can go so far even with this whole issue that MacArthur has proposed, and, and, and not so much that he's saying this, but others can take it even further than it needs to go to the point where Christians really start, start overanalyzing themselves. Uh, am I really a Christian? I mean, when you struggle and you have, co- and you have some sin in your life, you start uh, can, asking yourself, am I really a Christian? Listen, I, I, I don't think that's the right attitude either. I think that's something that can happen in both extremes. We tend to always go to the extremes on things. Just because someone struggles with some sin as a Christian doesn't mean they're not a Christian. But the nature of our human condition is we do do go to extremes. Um, I had a seminary professor that said we're never balanced. He says, we're always, if we ever look balanced, it's because we're passing through the middle, going to the other extreme. You know what I'm saying? And that's true. That's me. You know? That's true. See, someone said this. I think it was Jim Newhouser said this. He said, the gospel is like a bag of gold. Legalists, on the one hand, are trying to steal it by saying justification is gained by establishing your own righteousness by works. That's how you get that bag of gold. The other who's trying to steal it are the libertines, saying all I have to do is intellectually agree with some facts, live however I want, and I will still go to heaven. And this is nothing new to the 20th and 21st century. And see, this is exactly what James is addressing in chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And I'm not going to go through the whole passage. I want to focus on the part about Abraham because that's our text from Hebrews 11. But I do want to say something about verse 14 because in verse 14, you really get the idea of what he is talking about in that section of Scripture. In 2.14, notice he says this, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? And you just circle the word says. That's the issue. Says. Um, Can a professor, one who says he has faith, but no works, just because he's made a profession but no works, can that person be confident that that faith has saved him? If you have a King James Version, I think they've made a fatal error, uh, not fatal, but serious error in verse 14. They left out the word that or this. They asked, they go, I guess I got the right translation. I hope I do. Correct me afterwards. If I, don't correct me now. Just correct me afterwards and say you got the wrong translation. But one of the translations, one of the major translations, leaves out the word that. In other words, we're talking about that kind of faith, a profession in verse 14. Um, and I think they just say, can faith save him? Well, of course faith can save him. But the point is, we're talking about this kind of faith that has no works. So he sets forth in that verse the question he's trying to answer for the rest of the passage. Is it possible for human beings to make an outward profession about something they do not possess? You follow me? See, sometimes in our zeal for reaching people, we ask them to pray a prayer or to, like I said earlier, give some other public indication of their heart, and they can get confused into thinking that the outward action is what brings salvation. It does not. It's about changed heart. That is what saves you, friends. It's not a profession. See, he's a rhetorical question. His answer is no. No. He's anticipating the answer, no. That kind of faith cannot save him. No one ever gets saved, get this, by a profession of faith. It may be there, but what saves them is possession of faith. Remember, faith is a gift of God. God is the one that puts that faith in me and you. But it's an error to tell people that and for people to think that. And 
It's not a profession that links me to Christ. Understand that. It's not a profession that links me to Christ. It's not intellectual assent that links me to Christ. It's a possession of faith. And then he goes on and gives some examples of things. I'm not going to take our time this morning to look at all of to look at these things, but verse 17 he just reiterates the issue. Even so, faith if it has no works is dead. Being by itself, you see that in verse 17. And you see um, in verse 20, But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? It's useless. He uses terms in there, useless faith, demon faith, the demons believe, you know, and they shudder because they have better theology than you and I do. They know the truth. So how does these things, how do they harmonize with Jesus? How does James harmonize with the whole issue of justification? Because he uses the word justified in verse um, 21. In verse 21, he uses the word justification. You say, you see, you could, could argue with James. You could say, well, let's look at the words James uses. But see, James uses the very same word. He uses the word justified. So does Paul. He uses Abraham as an example. So does Paul. So how do we do this? First, turn to John 8, 24. I'm going to take you to some, show you how James sounds just like Jesus. This is what I want you to see. James talks just like Jesus talks. In John chapter 8, verse 24, we're going to come back to James, but just look at verse 24, John chapter 8. Therefore I said to you, this is Jesus speaking now, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. This is verse 24 of John chapter 8. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. See that? He's preaching the message of salvation to the Jews. Unless you believe, you'll die in your sins. That that is salvation by faith alone right there. See that? But Go down to verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, this is verse 31, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. See that? If you obey the word of God, see, they say they believe, they've made a profession. They've made a profession to believe in me. Now he says, back up your profession, back up your words by your works. You see that? So faith and works are a team. They're a team. If the work is not present, then Jesus did not consider faith to be present. Follow me? If the work is not present, then Jesus does not consider faith to be present. If you fill up a balloon with helium, you expect the balloon to do something, right? Rise. You fill up a sinner with the Holy Spirit, you expect him to rise. Now we sag at times. I understand that. I understand this. Up and down, but you understand what I mean? Regeneration makes a difference, is James' point. Go with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 45. That's John... Go to the book before John is the book of Luke in verse 45. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Verse 45 says of Luke chapter 6, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? See what he's saying there? The mouth speaks from what's in here. Why do you call me Lord and do not do the things I say? If, if you are evil toward Christ, if you are evil toward his church, <coughs> excuse me, if you're evil toward his words, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know or to figure out what's going on, on the inside, right? It doesn't take 
Uh, you don't have to know. You, you, you can understand. If you hear these things being said, then you can understand what's in the heart. Go up to verse 43 of Luke 6, just a f- above this. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. Verse 44, for each tree is known by its own fruit, for men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. If the sign says this is an apple tree over here, and you see lemons growing on it, you go, not an apple tree. I don't care what the sign says, not an apple tree. A tree is known by its fruit. And keep in mind, Jesus is speaking here, okay? Jesus is speaking here. This is no commentary by anybody else. This is Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 12, to the first gospel, Matthew chapter 12. It gets interesting here. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Verse 34 of Matthew chapter 12. It says, you brood of vipers, how can you, speaking to the Pharisees, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills his heart, just like we saw in Luke. The good man, out of his good treasure, brings forth what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. Outside will reveal what's on the inside. Then go to verse 36. Drop down to verse 36. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it on the day of judgment. For by, Now get this. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. See that? See, I can look at that on just reading and say, well, is Jesus teaching salvation by works? By your words, you will be justified. If salvation is by grace through faith alone, well, what is Jesus saying here? I'm going to talk about this when I go back to James, but he is using the word justification differently here. Understand that. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. He's using it, though, the same way that James is using it. See, the issue in John 8, 24, we saw earlier, it's salvation is by faith in Jesus. That's established. That's already been established. Now he is saying here that if you've been made from being dead to being made alive, it should change how you talk because faith and works, and the way Jesus is talking here, faith and works are very tight together. They're very tight together. Understand this. You can be justified or condemned by your works because your works reveal saving faith or unbelieving faith. They're so tightly connected. The works and the faith are so tightly connected in this passage. Jesus can read your heart, but he could look at your words and tell the very same thing. Follow me? He can listen to your words and tell the very same thing about your heart. That is what he's saying. You will be judged by your works, he's saying, because there's a tight connection there, a very tight connection. Listen, before salvation, there is no teamwork between faith and works, before salvation. But after salvation, there is a relationship between faith and works. It is faith alone before you're saved. It is faith and works after you are saved. Go to chapter 25 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. This is the sheep and goat judgment. He says the same thing. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. This is verse 41, I'm sorry. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, you did not visit me. 
then they, they will say, Lord, wouldn't we do all these things to you? And he say, he'll say, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did that to one of the least of these, you did it to me, that's verse 45. But then he says in verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So he says, on the basis of how you treated people, see that? On the basis of how you treated people, the goats are condemned. They have no Christian character, no evidence of any kind of faith in their lives, no love, no kindness. But once again, it's how you live on the outside that is an indicator of a true spiritual condition. That's the point that Jesus is making. If you are a believer in me, Jesus is saying, it will make a difference. It will make a difference. You know, we want, we want the words alone. We want the words alone to be proof of saving faith. We do. I heard you say it. I listened to you pray it. But see, Jesus didn't say it, see it that way at all. James does not see it that way at all. You are saved not by, by, it's not that you are saved by works, but they are proof that saving faith is present. Go back to James chapter 22, verse 21. James 2, verse 21. So, all I want to say is, what James is talking about is different from what Paul is talking about. He's addressing a different situation. He is addressing a post-salvation teamwork that exists between faith and works. And he uses Abraham and Rahab. Both of these individuals are listed in Hebrews 11. A patriarch and a prostitute. They both are examples of faith to us in Hebrews 11. And when God gave them this gift of saving faith, it made a difference in their lives. See, that's the point that James has here in using Abraham in verse 21. Was not Abraham, see this in James 2 verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? That's the scene I just told you about at the beginning of our sermon this morning. And understand words, words have different meanings. Justified is like, say, say you take, <clears throat> has a different meaning in this passage, a lesser meaning in this passage, than it would in justification by faith alone. In this passage, it would be like the word nursery. The word nursery. Is that a place you buy flowers? Or is it a place where babies are changed, right? It's a, it's, it's, this, it's a different, different meaning to whoever's listening to it. Talk about so, uh, football. You talk about football in this town, we know what that means. You talk about football in South America, they have a whole different meaning of it, right? You talk about the word rock. Uh, are you talking about a stone? Are you talking about something you do in a, a rocking chair? Are you talking about something that, uh, that uh, a type of music? Uh, are you talking about somebody's name, right? Words just have different meanings. When I use a, a word in a sentence like, in, or, or Paul did, for example, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Women will be saved in childbirth. Think about that. I think it's talking about the stigma of being involved in the fall, and they will be able to raise children is what that's talking about. That word saved means rescued. They're rescued from that stigma. But, you know, if you take the, say, well, you're talking about the doctrine of salvation there. If you take all of what's involved in salvation and apply it to that statement, it would seem to be saying that Paul is going to save you women when they have children. They don't feel that way, do they? All the time. But think about that. Uh, or an unbelieving husband is sanctified by his believing wife. Think about that. The whole doctrine of sanctification behind that word, as it's used there in that sentence, in that statement, there's a whole doctrine of justification, a whole doctrine of salvation, a whole doctrine of sanctification that's filled with tons of theology. And all I'm saying is every time you see it used in a passage, I need to look at the context and determine if that is what it's talking about in its fullest meaning all the time. The unbelieving spouse married to a believing spouse, they aren't sanctified by marrying a believer, are they? Are we saying that? 
No, we're just simply saying they're the, they get the blessing of living in the home with a believer. It has a lesser meaning. It doesn't have the full theological meaning that we sometimes think these words have. So was not Abraham our father, the better interpretation that be vindicated. Vindicated. Follow me? Proven. Was not Abraham our father proven by his works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? Paul and James are fighting two different battles, as I said earlier. Paul is battling legalists who want to add human merit to salvation and justification. James is battling people who want to remove works from the results of salvation. Two different battles. Paul is talking about pre-salvation in Romans. James is talking about post-salvation. Because Paul was concerned about works. He were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And like I said earlier, Paul is using the word justified the way Jesus used it. Paul is using it more in a legal sense. And this was evidence in Abraham's faith. He he, as I told you and as we went through that passage, he demonstrated his faith in God by his actions with his son Isaac. Go down to verse 22. You see, talking about Abraham, gives an explanation that faith was working with his works. See that? Faith was working with his works. That's the word we get synergism from. Faith was working with his, working with something. It's, syner, it's synergistic. Faith works with works. Before salvation, it's, we use the term monergistic, meaning only one, only God is involved in salvation. God, the reason you're saved is because God does a work. He regenerates you. He brings you to salvation. He gives you the gift of faith. And then James is saying, that faith works with works. You follow me? That saving faith that God gives monergistically becomes synergistic. It works with works. So they have a working together relationship. And it's perfected. See that? It's shown to be true, completed in verse 22. So all I'm just saying this morning is mere intellectual belief in God is is incomplete. It's not complete. It is complete when it works, when it works. James is dealing with assurance of salvation. Paul is dealing with, James is dealing with, you already have it. You already have the faith. He's not dealing with how you get the faith. I told you this last week, but last time, but it's, there's an objective and a subjective side to this. Objectively, God's promises are true. Uh, he promises to forgive you when you repent. It's, it's done, man. He forgives, totally forgives you. That settles it. Nothing can change that for the believer. The subjective side of it is sometimes we say things we don't mean. We just say it. But when true saving faith is there, our attitude and our actions begin to change. That produces assurance in our lives. We begin to grow in Christ. We begin to see ourselves changing in our actions and attitudes. That's synergism. That's faith working with works. And to make sure no one accuses James of saying that it's not faith alone that saves you, he quotes in verse 23 from Genesis. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. See that? In verse 23. No one can accuse me of saying that faith alone doesn't save you. But the faith that saves you is never alone. As Reformers said, See, that scene with Isaac took place 10 years, 10, or, excuse me, more, 10 years after Genesis 3.15, but I, I think it's, excuse me, 
12.3, but no, 15.6. But the point is, I really believe he was saved before that. But the point is, many years had passed since the scene with Isaac, but his belief produced that obedience. And that's the reason he uses. And it vindicated the fact that his faith was real. So they go together. Worthless faith does not justify. Then he uses Rahab as another illustration. Let me close with this quote by John Calvin. As Paul contends that men are justified without the aid of works, so James will not allow any to be regarded as justified who are destitute of good works. An empty phantom of faith does not justify. Now, what are you depending on today? What are you depending on? Are you depending on just what you verbalized? Are you depending on a faith that has been, that you see working, a real true faith that you've seen being worked out in your life? Your works will never save you, but true saving faith is a faith that works. Ask yourself that question. We never, none of us do enough. That's not the point. We all fail. That's not the point. We all get weak, and we're all still carrying around a fallen flesh. We fail. I understand that. I understand it really well. But the point is, is the progression of my life one in which I desire to become more and more like Christ? That's the question. And that is what saving faith produces in us. That's not some natural inclination of our hearts. That's something that God puts there when he puts faith there. Do you have that faith? That's the question. I invite you to turn to Christ if you don't. Cry out to God for that faith and trust him. Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. We thank you, Father, for what you have given to us in Christ. I pray, Father, that we will learn from the, those who have gone before us, from the ancient paths that have been trodden, God. May we imitate their faith, a faith that works. Oh, God, we praise you and thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.